Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. Today, we're so fortunate to be joined by the fantastically talented Sherry Kola to talk all about Freeform's Good Trouble. And I wanted to start by diving back to talk about when you first auditioned for the show, because from the way you've described it, it sounds like it was actually one of the more emotionally layered scenes that you auditioned with. And at that point in your career, because you had been kind of moving forward so much in the comedy world, I was really interested in how that potential Potentially pushed you outside of your comfort zone a little bit with some of the emotional spaces you were stepping into in the audition and how that also helped you to really unpack a lot of different sides and layers in Alice as a character so early in the process. Wow, I love that question. Uh, yeah, first of all, I was already so touched that this character was written and someone wanted to see this on the screen because it'd been missing uh, pretty much my entire life, you know? And, and it was such a relatable character, you know, this queer Asian female, um, just kind of navigating the ups and downs, relationships, messiness of her identities, et cetera. So um, I'd been doing stand up and I had some viral funny videos at this point. I'd done some acting, but mostly in comedy. And, you know, this was the first time I really was dramatic, if you will. You know, in the audition, uh, there was a scene where kind of uh, tears were evoked, you know, and I really got there by listening to Sam Smith and Sarah Bareilles <laughs> and just digging deep into, you know, my third grade crush uh, that ghosted me on the playground. Um, but, you know, that's the thing about characters and I'm realizing that we're not actually pretending to be someone else when we act. We are finding versions of ourselves, people who we've been in the past and we bring it into these characters, you know, because Alice really is me, you know, um, in a time where I always bottled, bottled up my emotions or in a time where I didn't really speak up in a time where I put others before myself, you know, so um, yeah, the audition process is so interesting, but I remember there were a few rounds, you know, and uh, my first one was fine, to be honest, like it was fine. Uh, but the second one, like with the producers, I really knocked it out the park and I even like surprised myself, you know, um, and the, the final one, it was down to me and this other girl. And, and it's just, there's so much anxiety because like you sign the contracts, you know, you, you, you know what you're getting yourself into, but you might not get it. You know, and, and it's just I remember getting that call and I immediately cried because I knew what this character meant for my community. You know, this character had the potential uh, to be a role model, you know, and, and because she doesn't exist on the TV screen often. So um, it really means a lot to be able to portray her. And that's the beautiful thing about TV. We've done 50 episodes now. So I'm learning about Alice as I go. You know, in the very beginning, day one, I'm like, oh, Alice is Sherry. But as we progressed in the seasons, like it, it started to divide. And and I realized, uh, you know, oh, Alice is definitely a different person. And there's things to her um, that I'm discovering and I'm learning about. And, I, you know, I, I learned so much from her and, you know, vice versa. So it, it's just, you know, it's it's funny thinking about the the name Alice. It meant nothing to me three years ago. But now now this this name Alice I would get it tattooed. I also really love that you were touching upon this slight internalization and the way that she bottles up emotions in a certain way. And it's been a really beautiful trajectory to watch over the seasons and the way that she has come into herself and found her voice and, and doesn't do that as much. But there are still moments where her way of processing something is to cover it with a joke and not say it out loud. And so from a performance standpoint, I was interested in the unique challenge of finding different expressions through the internalized aspects of her as a character, but also so how as you get deeper into her as a character, there's actually a little bit less of that. And you're thinking more consciously about the small flex where it would still creep up for her. Yeah. I mean, first of all, old habits die hard, you know, like as much as she's using her voice and meeting new people and standing up for herself, there's still moments where it's like and, and I can relate to that as well. You know, like especially with with her trying to have a career in comedy like we can all relate to, you know, wanting to get ahead in our career, but what are we sacrificing? You know, it's like, I, I want to speak up about this, but if I do, then like, you know, I might jeopardize this opportunity. So maybe I won't, but, but it's, it's a constant, it's a constant conflict, even for me, you know, it's like, I think about, um, like, I remember, uh, when, when the 
I don't even know if this is along the lines of what we're even talking about, but kind of, but I was uh, doing stand up the same week the Atlanta shooting happened. And it was so devastating. And, you know, it was so emotional. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, I'm going to do stand up. Like, do I talk about it? Well, I've been so vocal about it on social media. And this is a part of my, you know, thoughts and feelings. Like, I have to talk about it. But I'm like, okay, this guy who books the Laugh Factory, he told me to, to host a show to set the tone, to warm up the crowd. Is it too much? Is it too aggressive? You know? Oh, no, but fuck. No. But I have to talk about it because this is this is my community. Like we're going through something. I have to be vocal. I have to express. But if I do, it'll, it has to be the perfect joke. You know, I can't just throw away this topic, you know, but it's like, uh, no, but it, it might be. It, it just it was so conflicting, you know, of like the stand up for yourself versus bottle your emotions. Exactly this. Um, so I ended up talking about it. And, you know, it, it really goes a long way, like just speaking up and speaking out about things, because I'm pretty sure half the people in the audience didn't even know about the Atlanta shooting. And now they know. Um, that's what's so beautiful about TV and comedy and everything. Like we're we're teaching in a way that's almost like brainwashing, you know, it's like we're entertaining, but um, people are walking away with some insight, um, which is really cool. Like just seeing seeing Alice go through that journey of like the conflict of, of standing up for yourself and like, you know, wanting to leave the old you behind, you know, but of course it's like, you'll always be you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, ah, I might be rambling. <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I even answered that show. question. Did I even answer that question? Kind of. No, you did in a really interesting and unexpected way, and I loved it. Good, good, good. <laughs> I also wanted to talk a little bit about the art form of the comedy scenes within the show, because when you're playing Alice and we're seeing her in the comedy program performing sketches or previous scenes with actual stand up on stage, you're always coming in at the middle of a scene, but yet we still have to have such an essence of what's the character she's playing in this sketch? What are they talking about? What's kind of the overall theme and, and tone of it? And yet you're capturing that within just a few lines of dialogue. And so I was really interested in how you navigate stepping into those types of scenes and really capturing the essence of all of those aspects in what is sometimes actually just a few lines of dialogue. Yeah, uh, you're talking about the sketches, right? How we cut in, in between the sketches mm -hmm. and stuff. First of all, the writers are brilliant. The way Good Trouble is cut together and like edited and like the, the, the placements of the scenes and the timing of everything is just so uh, through the roof, just perfect. Um, but yeah, those, those scenes are really fun because coming from comedy, especially with my, you know, uh, diversity program squad, these actors that I've truly fallen in love with and we, we've all become friends. Um, it's fun for us because we come from comedy and to be able to like, just do quick characters and improvise and, you know, go off the top and just make it our own. Like, I mean, it's a dream come true to be able to do that for a living. So, uh, you know, with the wigs and like the, the costume changes, like, you know, I'm pretty sure all of us have dreamt of being on SNL, you know? So this is like essentially that, these quick sketches. Um, but yeah, it is interesting because sometimes it is just like two lines of something, but um, we we just, we have fun with it. It's such a fun world. And the fact that we had Margaret Cho, are you kidding me? Like Margaret Cho is the original bisexual female stand-up Asian comic. And like, that's what I am. And I just, you dream of maybe meeting her one day. You never even think that you would be on the same show with her, sharing the screen. And I also have done stand up with her and we're sharing the stage. And it's like, what? She has my phone number. I was just on her podcast. Like, I'm so grateful for this TV show because it's given me so much, you know? Yeah. In working with someone like Margaret Cho and seeing the career that she's carved out for herself, it's really astounding how she's always been so authentic and so true to the voice that she wants to have as an artist. And in working with her, I was interested in how you've really looked to that and if it's made you think differently at all to your own relationship with your voice as an artist, both as an actor and as a comedian, and stepping into both of those spaces and, and just the authenticity, authenticity that you always carry through as well. Margaret Cho is an icon. Um, she truly has inspired me, you know, for so many years and being in front of her face, like it inspires me even more because she's a dream, so humble, so happy to be there, you know, and, and, you know, we talk about her career, you know, she had the very first Asian American sitcom in the nineties, um, 
she paved the way in so many ways and, and has never strayed away from being herself. And, and, and I, I strive to live genuinely like that as well. You know, I say that all the time. Like, I don't think I've ever pretended to be someone I'm not. I think I've gotten this far in my career by being myself. I was never the hot one. You know what I mean? I was never really the smart one either. Uh, but I was always like saying the darnest things the 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 weird one you know the one where like i would just be there and, and people you know, i would say something and people would be like what the heck you know but i never strayed away from that you know i i just embraced it i guess and, and that's what's making me shine now you know just these um yeah the authentic voice of it all you know embracing and celebrating all of your layers which i didn't you know i mean i, I always talk about how society never roots for someone who's an immigrant queer, Asian woman, even, you know what I mean? All these things that society um, doesn't prioritize, we're finally owning it and defining it for ourselves and reclaiming it um, and kind of using it as a superpower, you know? Within that as well, your career trajectory is so interesting because I, I love the fact that you were thinking about performing for such a long time before you actually started moving forward and suddenly jumped into auditioning, performing, but also training at the same time at UCB. And I wanted to just ask about that kind of tipping point for you and what the internal dialogue was that you were having with yourself, where you knew that that was a space that you were really interested in and wanted to pursue, but something, you know, kind of like what the elements were that were holding you back and then the tipping point in finally pursuing it. You know, it's so interesting. Like, I feel like all of the transitions were so natural, um, especially in the last few years. But yeah, I was always um, passionate about performing and I loved telling jokes. I was voted most outgoing, you know, in the yearbook. Um, I was hosting the talent show and, you know, making funny videos in a film club. But truly as an immigrant, especially because that foreigner feeling never fades, um, I thought to myself, Hollywood, is for Americans, you know, like Jackie Chan exists, Lucy Liu exists, like it doesn't seem like there's room for me because it felt like such a gamble. Um, so when I went to college, I just majored in entertainment studies, something broad. And even then I had no direction. I was making funny videos on Vine. I was um, making a SoundCloud, making SoundCloud songs because I wanted to be a rapper because I've always loved hip hop. Um, I just had so many passions that I wasn't focused on one. And then I started doing radio on campus uh, in college and I kind of fell in love with it. And I realized, OK, maybe this is what I'll do. Like, I've always wanted to do stand up and yet I haven't done it because I remember even in my early 20s, I went to the Hollywood Improv and I put my name in the thing, but I never got picked. You know, just like I just kept putting it off. So I ended up doing radio for three years in college. I mean, it was internet radio. There were like 22 listeners. Um, but I was like, okay, let me just broadcast my personality this way. You know, I can just tell jokes about pop culture and also play music. Perfect. So after college, I got a job at Amp Radio, 97.1 FM here in LA. And um, with radio, it's his own beast. You know, you have to start on the street team. You're passing out stickers. You know, you're you're at you're setting up a tent at a 7-Eleven. You know, at the same time, two days later, you're escorting Taylor Swift at the forum. It was such a roller coaster of of a job. Um, but I climbed my way up there because while I was there, maybe two years in, and this was in 2016, I started doing stand up once and for all, and I had this viral character um, who was a rapper. Uh, hit like millions of views. And it, it was a, this epiphany of like, oh, wow, comedy. Yes, comedy, duh. My day one, Old Faithful comedy. And Carson Daly, who was the morning show host on Amp Radio at the time, he caught wind of the fact that I was in the building. Like, and he was like, why are we not using her? What? So then I went on to, to, you know, be on air. And then I had my own show on Sunday nights. At the same time, like I started acting and I was taking the UCB classes. And it was just this, fluid transition of me realizing that life is too short for just one dream, number one. And two, like, you don't know what you're capable of until you're given the opportunity to do it. You know, like, I never thought I'd do drama. And here I was. TV? What? I wanted to do radio. I didn't want to show my face. What? You know what I mean? It's like, we just keep stretching um, our, our, our skills and our passions because you, you should never limit yourself, you know, because that's what we were tricked into believing for so long. 
Jumping back to the show, I wanted to talk about a lot of the ensemble scenes at the Coterie because there's so many delicious moments where you get to have all of the characters together in a room. And I think there's so many interesting explorations of character because you have moments where you're right in front of the camera and you're having dialogue scenes, but there's also a lot of moments where it's bouncing off of another character dynamic or even just those little flickers where the camera's passing and panning over everybody and we're seeing little moments in the background of scenes. And so I was very interested in the dynamic of shooting a lot of those scenes and how it allows you to explore different facets of character, particularly with how much coverage it is that you're all capturing throughout the day. There's so much coverage and it goes a long way. Like the looks we give to each other, just say everything. <laughs> I'm so impressed by this show. Like it really it matters. These little moments that tie the story together. If you blink and you don't see Malika and, and, and Davia exchange a look, <laughs> like you know what I mean like it's just it's so important um and it's also really beautiful and I'm so proud of uh our cast and crew because we shot in the pandemic we did 19 episodes in a whole ass pandemic and you know we never had a shutdown everyone was so disciplined and realized the importance and really the gratitude of the fact that we still get to make tv during these times so um those group scenes were especially special because we couldn't even technically hug, you know, we had to do the masks on like when, when the camera yelled cut and, you know, uh, it really made us never take it for granted, you know, like it made us really value the human connection and how lucky we, lucky we are to tell these stories and how lucky we are to be surrounded by this family. Um, but yeah, Good Trouble is all about those looks. There's so many arcs, there's so many stories. I mean, there's like seven of us, you know, uh, or eight of us, I can't even count anymore, uh, who have these deep storylines. We literally have these deep storylines and somehow they fit it all, especially into the Lunar New Year episode. Like, I, I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they did it. Like. On top of Lunar New Year episode, Alice going through all these things. We have, you know, Malika's polyamorous relationship. We have, you know, Gael and, and, and pregnant Isabella. And then we have like Mariana and Callie and we have Dennis and Dominic. I mean, how do they do it? It is so impressive that they pack all that in under an hour. Like people need to recognize that Good Trouble is the perfect TV show. Yeah. It's so impressive because to your point, it's not even just the seven main characters. It's also the fact that each of them have their entire ecosystem. So with Alice, we also get to know her family. We have, you know, Sumi and we have all of the people that she's doing comedy with as well. So there's all these extra characters for every single one of them. Yeah. But when you got those scripts early on and it was like, okay, so these are her parents, this is her family, this is her relationship dynamic. How has that always really aided you in having a lot of different layers to unpack with the fact that the scripts actually give you a lot of details that often in an ensemble drama, you would have to create and shape yourself uh well i mean it's first of all it's just so cool that alice has all these worlds you know because that's human right we have so many worlds we have our family we have our work friends our our roommates uh you know our our lovers um, and uh yeah like my tv mom uh has two sons in real life so she loves me. She loves like holding my hand and like, you know, like putting her arm around me, always taking selfies on set because it's like I'm the daughter she never had. Um, and it was really cool because my my real mom came to visit set one day uh, when I had a scene with my family. So I have like pictures of that and it's just really cool kind of combining the worlds. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just it's just really cool to have all these worlds and, and, and you you see what's on the script um what they lay out but it really is in the characters to bring it to life you know and they really trust us the writers and the producers really trust us because at this point like they always say like you don't know like you you know alice more than anyone like sherry knows alice more than anyone like i live with this bitch this bitch is inside me you know what i mean like she is my mind body and soul like the creators created her but like you know bringing her to life and really finding her personality um was such a beautiful journey too and like we're still learning you know we're still learning more and more things about this girl who uh kind of spread her wings and it's just it's just really cool it's really cool so the, the writers are brilliant um and them letting us make it our own is just the cherry on top
In the Lunar New Year episode, I really loved the scenes and the moments that we had with Alice and her brother because I think there's something so entertaining to watch the way that they're they immediately just regress to who they were as kids. And so it's exploring both their relationship dynamic as adults, but you also get a real insight as to who they both were as children and as siblings with each other. And so just was interested in in filming those scenes in particular as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like siblings will be siblings. The thing is, I actually have a really small family because we were all born in Shanghai under the one child rule. And I only have three cousins total and one's in China. One lives in Oceanside and one lives with my mom. So it's like my my family's pretty small and I have uh, two half sisters. Um, so that brother dynamic is is new to me and I love it. I, I fully embraced it um, as Alice. And, and, you know, we can all relate to growing up with um, family and, and just kind of having that love, hate, bullying of relationship, you know, unconditional yet get out of my face, you know? Um, so it was really cool playing that. Uh, with with Alice and David because you know we can all relate to being compared to a sibling or just anyone in your family and you know competing for your parents approval you know what I mean and like you know it, it's it's so petty <laughs> that relationship is so petty but it's just so loving at the same time so I love that um we really explored it, you know, them, them talking crap to each other. And then later, later full circle with understanding each other and Alice coming out to her brother once and for all, you know what I mean? Because uh, there's so many layers to that, that I'm still unpacking, but, you know, growing up queer, you hardly talk about your dating life. I'm sorry, growing up Asian, you hardly talk about your dating life at the dinner table, let alone queerness, let alone sexuality. You know what I mean? So all these things are like so tiptoey um, within the AAPI uh, family dynamic that, you know, she came out to her parents, uh, but coming out to her brother is a whole nother battle, you know, because it's like, well, he might see me a different way. What if he treats me differently? All these, all these feelings, um, which is so relatable universally. And, and she just blurts it out and he doesn't even care. He's like, I miss you. I don't care, you little you little booger. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care, like get over here. Um, so it, it really is beautiful exploring that dynamic as well. Yeah, I also, I really appreciate the way that the show has explored Alice's journey in coming out and her sexuality, not just as like a one episode or a three episode arc, but as something which is a continuous journey for her. And even once she comes out, what does that mean for different relationship dynamics? Who is she within the community? And who does she want to be within this space? Um, and what point when you first started getting scripts and details for her as a character early on, did you start to realize that this wasn't something that they were gonna just address in one singular script, but that this was going to be something that you were gonna really have the opportunity to explore in such a unique and beautiful way through her as a character? Yeah, I mean, I think I always knew it because Good Trouble is just so good at what they do. Uh, coming out is not overnight. You know, even when I had the conversation with my own mother about being bisexual, like it was 45 minutes of me crying. And to be honest, the conversation is still going. You know, I still have to remind her that I may have a wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, all these things and these conversations um, are ongoing. And that's why Good Trouble is so real. Yeah, like in season one, there was the you know, going through bizarre lengths to hide who she is, Alice, uh, uh, from her parents, because, you know, she was queer and she wasn't comfortable and she was scared, terrified of telling her parents and um, being challenged in that way. And then that was stressed. And then like, you know, um, season two, there was Alice learning more about the other um, uh, corners of the LGBTQ plus community, educating herself and making mistakes along the way and really just being human and understanding everyone's experience um, within the queer community, um, you know, dating non-binary lovers, you know? And uh, and then, you know, we, we see her talk about queerness on stage. And then in, in season three, it's like, okay, now, now balancing being queer and Asian. And it's like, okay, what's the priority? Like what, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be diverse, but to what extent, like I'm still checking these boxes, but this is who I am. And, you know, um, it, it just, it's a never ending conversation, just like it is in real life. You know what I mean? Like I'm still unpacking so many things um, about this, this experience. So I, it, it's, I'm sure it'll go on even in, in the in the potential season four. You know, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know yet. Um, but I'm pretty sure it'll be a conversation through and through. 
Yeah. And the Lunar New Year episode also gave so much to unpack with Alice and Sumi, but I actually wanted to ask specifically about the scene where they're lion dancing and the, the process of the choreography of that scene coming together, because I thought it was brilliantly no. done. We had rehearsals, y'all. I was out here. First of all, Good Trouble really challenging my uh, dance skills. Let's not forget about the sexy cabaret situation with the boobies and the heels uh, in the snatch ponytail of Malika's birthday episode. Um, I was throwing it back, honey. So now we have this dance challenge this TikTok dance challenge of the, of the lion dance. Uh, so we definitely had uh, rehearsals for that. Carol Wang and I uh, were working with these dudes from Monterey Park who, you know, do this for a living and they're so good. They're doing like backflips and like spins. Um, and I'm over here barely, barely just like <laughs> doing the two-step, uh, but we were learning tricks. So like with the with the lion dance, you, you, you pull this string for the mouth to move at the same time, you're grabbing red envelopes. And at the same time, you're like, like you're, you're, there's two people in it. It was, it was one of these situations, you know? I can hardly play bop it, okay? Um, so this was a challenge, uh, but a really good challenge. And I'm so excited that Kara Wang and I got to do that together because it's such a specific part of Lunar New Year, you know? Like the, the, the line dance, we had the red envelopes, we had the burning of the money, that ritual. We had the, the baijo, the rice wine. We had, you know, all the superstitions um, that I know the community will appreciate, you know, the not cutting your hair on the, the New Year day uh, because then you're, you're, you're getting rid of the good luck, um, the wearing red underwear, um, the, the whole fish at dinner. Like that's all so important to this tradition and to this culture is something that I've been celebrating my entire life. And the fact that I get to share this on the screen and Alice is proud enough to share this um, with her, her friends and family. Like it really, it means the world to me. Yeah. And with all the episodes that you've done at this point and the amount of time that you've spent sitting with Alice as a character, how do you feel that that, that has like really shaped an evolution for you as a performer and as, as an actor in terms of the tools and the skill sets that you've developed through playing her? Oh, so many tools, so many skill sets. Zuri and I always say that Good Trouble is a classroom in so many ways with what we learn um, about the themes and the topics and also what we learn on set. You know, uh, this is my first series regular role, you know, like I've done some guest stars here and there, you know, I've done some comedy things, but like I've never dived this deep into a character um, and to be able to experiment, you know, and and make her mine and, and do all these things and, you know, with comedy and with the drama, you know, and I just, I'm so grateful to be able to um, tell this story, especially through this character. That's the thing. It's like, not everyone is proud of the show they're on, to be honest with you, you know, and a fan of the show they're on. Like, I feel so lucky um, and fortunate to be able to, to become a better actor through this character, through this show. So it, it just, yeah, really, really goosebumps, goosebumps for real. I absolutely love the journey that you've taken her on as a character so far, and I'm so excited to see where that trajectory continues with the show. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my love. I'll see you soon. Oh, and also uh, the, the, uh, the love between the two Asian women. Uh, we talked about it, right? It's <laughs> yes. Kara and Sumi. I mean, Sumi and, Sumi and Sherry. I mean, Sumi and Alex. <laughs> what are the names? Represent. Okay, bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you.